qui est cet après-midi, on va même changer de langue, il y a toujours du monde. Donc c'est déjà un plaisir de... Un plaisir pour vous, l'équipe des parlantes, un plaisir aussi de vous accueillir ici dans cette belle librairie, un plaisir d'avoir de, des comédiens et comédiennes, des lectrices en tout cas, qui vont nous réciter, ou en tout cas nous lire un texte en anglais. Il y a une histoire de jambon congé, faites attention. Gigo d'agneau. Jambon congé, Gigo d'agneau. Euh, quoi dire encore Eh bien, donc, remercier bien sûr euh, tous nos partenaires et principalement ici la librairie Agora. Euh, un petit mot peut-être de l'école d'où vous venez de vous représenter oui, donc euh, on est les trois euh, enseignantes euh, à l'échelle V, donc euh, c'est l'Institut des langues vivantes, qui sont en cours ici à l'Université euh, de Liège. Donc moi je suis en cours euh, en faculté. Je suis en cours complémentaire ce soir. Et moi je m'occupe pour la traduction, euh, la traduction en général. Et donc vous savez, vous avez des cours, mais il y a des, des, il y a des cours en euh, formation continue, en cours du soir, en de toutes sortes, en anglais, en irlandais, en espagnol, en italien. Et voilà, des choses qu'on nous propose. Et alors c'est un, une lecture un peu théâtralisée, et elles m'ont certifié qu'elles n'avaient pas bu le whisky. <rire> Donc elles sont... c'est du, du vrai Non, j'ai bu un petit peu. <rire> Non, mais on peut vous assurer, comme c'est une lecture anglaise et pas écossaise. Non, c'est du vrai Voilà. Avant de vous laisser en compagnie de nos lectrices, encore deux mots. D'abord, pour vous signaler que si vous avez besoin de carnet, j'en ai à votre disposition. Je vais après. C'est le carnet des parlants, tout simplement. Vous en voulez Voilà. Euh, simplement aussi, vous nous signalez que les, les parlantes sont le, les parlantes sont aussi partenaires de l'ensemble de la, de la saison d'accueil de, de, et de signature que Agora organise à partir de, donc de vendredi prochain, le 22, avec Armel Job, que nous retrouverons ici. Et donc, euh, j'ai à votre disposition tout le programme ici, avec euh, d'autres euh, activités et parlantes. Pour le printemps, les parlantes, c'est aussi euh, des activités après le festival. C'est presque comme... Le terre, le centre de l'Angleterre. Le voilà. Le terre est galloise anglaise. Oui, voilà. Donc, vous partez galloise, donc euh, l'accent anglais assez typique. Et euh, Mary vient de euh, Mississippi qui est, comme on appelle, la, la sud profonde des États-Unis, avec un centre typique de là. Et je viens de Chicago, dans le centre euh, du pays, avec un accent sans typique de là. Peut-être que nos accents sont un petit peu abaissés, euh, le fait qu'on vit depuis longtemps ici. Mais vous allez entendre les différences de tonalité de voix et, et aussi d'accent. Vous avoir un certain intérêt pour eux. Lamps okay. alike, hers and the one by the empty chair opposite. On the sideboard behind her, two tall glasses, soda water and whiskey. Fresh ice cubes in the thermos bucket. Mary Maloney was waiting for her husband to come home from work. Now and again she would glance up at the clock, but without anxiety, merely to please herself with the thought. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. She took his coat and hung it in the closet. <laughs> Then she walked over and made the drink. A strongish one for him. <laughs> oh, oh. 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 And a weaker one for herself. <laughs> and soon she was back again in her chair with the sewing, and he and the other opposite, holding the tall glass with both hands, rocking it so the ice cubes tinkled against the side. And as he spoke, he did an unusual thing. He lifted his glass and drained it in one swallow. Although there was still half of it left, at least half of it left. She wasn't really watching him, but she knew what he'd done 
because she heard the ice cubes fall back against the bottom of the empty glass when he lowered his arm. He watched him as he began to sip the dark yellow liquid, and she could see little oily swirls in the liquid because it was so strong. I think it's a shame that when a policeman gets to be as senior as you, they keep him walking about on his feet all day long. He didn't answer, so she bent over by the lamp. Sit down just for a minute. Sit down. It wasn't till then that she began to get frightened. Go on, sit down. She lowered herself back slowly into the chair, watching him all the time with those large, <laughs> bewildered eyes. He had finished with the second grade and was staring into the glass, frowning. Listen, I've got something to tell you. What is it, darling? What's the matter? He had now become absolutely motionless, and he kept his head down so that the light from the lamp beside him fell across the upper part of his face, leaving the chin and the mouth in shadow. She noticed it didn't take long, four or five minutes at the most, and she sat very still through it all, watching him with a kind of dazed horror as he went further and further away from her with each word. So there it is, and I know it's a kind of a bad time to be telling you, but there was simply no other way. Of course, I'll give you money and see that you're looked after. But there needn't really be any fuss. I hope not anyway. It wouldn't be very good for my job. Breeze, the hand inside the cabinet taking hold of the first object it met. She lifted it out and looked at it. <laughs> it was wrapped in paper, so she took off the paper and looked at it again. A leg of lamb. All right, then. They would have lamb for supper. She carried it upstairs, holding the thin bone end of it with both her hands. And as she went through the living room, she saw him standing over by the window with his back to her, and she stopped. For God's sakes, don't make supper for me. I'm going out. And at that point... Mary Maloney simply walked up behind him and without any pause swung the big frozen leg of lamb high in the air and brought it down as hard as she could on the back of his head. She might as well have hit him with a steel club. She stepped back a pace, waiting, and funny thing was he remained standing there for at least four or five seconds, swaying gently. Then he crashed to the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> she came out slowly, feeling cold and surprised, and she stood for a while, blinking at the body. Still holding that ridiculous piece of meat, tight with both hands. Okay, all right, so, uh, so I've killed him. It was extraordinary now. How clear her mind became. All of a sudden, she began thinking very fast. As the wife of a detective, she knew quite well what the penalty would be. That was fine. It made no difference to her. In fact, it would be a relief. On the other hand, rightly allowed. The voice sounded peculiar, too. Um, hello, oh, Sam. I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes. Yes, and I think a can of peas. Well, that was better. Both the smile and the voice were coming out better now. She rehearsed it several times more. Then she ran downstairs, took her coat, went out the back door, down the garden, and into the street. It wasn't six o'clock yet, and the lights were still on in the grocery shop. Hello, Sam. Why, good evening, Mrs. Maloney. How are you? Oh, I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and um, I think it can be peas. The man turned and reached up behind him on the shelf for the peas. Patrick decided he's tired and he doesn't want to eat out tonight. We usually go out Thursdays, you know, and now he's caught me without any vegetables in the house. Now she told herself as she turned back. All she was doing now she was returning home to her husband, and he was waiting for his supper. 
and she must cook it well and make it as tasty as possible because the poor man was tired. And if, when she entered the house, she happened to find anything unusual or tragic or terrible, then naturally it would be a shock and she'd become frantic with grief and horror. She put the parcel down on the table and went through into the living room. And when she saw him lying there on the floor with his legs doubled up and one arm twisted back underneath his body, he was really rather shocked. All the old love and longing for him welled up inside her, and she ran over. It was easy. No acting was necessary. A few minutes later, she got up and went to the phone. She knew the number of the police station, and when the man at the other end answered, she cried. Two policemen walked in. <laughs> she knew them both. She knew nearly all the men in the precinct, and she fell right into a chair, and then went over to join the other one, who was called O'Malley, kneeling by the body. Is he... is he dead? I'm afraid he is. What happened? <laughs> Briefly, she told her story about going out to the grocer and coming back to find him on the floor while she was talking, crying and talking. Newman discovered a small patch of blood on the dead man's hand. He showed it to O'Malley. <laughs> who got up at once and hurried to the phone. She greeted her kindly. She told her story again, this time right from the beginning, when Patrick had come in and she was sewing, he was tired, so tired he hadn't wanted to go out for supper. He just went outside and into the street. In 15 minutes, he was back with a page of notes, and there was more whispering. <laughs> and through her sobbing, she heard a few of the whispered phrases. Acting quite normal. Very cheerful. Why don't you give him a good supper? Peas. Cheesecake. Impossible that she. After a while, the photographer and the doctor departed, and two other men came in, and they took the corpse away in a stretcher. <laughs> then, the fingerprint print man went away. The two detectives remained, and so did the two policemen. They were exceptionally nice to her. And Jack Noonan asked if she wouldn't rather go somewhere else, to her sister's house perhaps, or to his own wife, who would take care of her and put her up for the night. No, she said. No, no, I'd like to stay right where I am, in this chair. Um, a little later, perhaps, when I feel better, then I'll move. So they left her there while I went about her business searching the house. Occasionally, one of the detectives came to her and asked her a question. Sometimes Jack Newton spoke at her gently as he passed by. Her husband, he told her, had had been killed by a blow on the back of the head, administered with a heavy blunt instrument. Almost certainly a large piece of metal. They were looking for the weapon. The murderer may have taken it with him, but on the other hand, he may have thrown it away, or hidden it somewhere on the premises. Okay. She sometimes heard their footsteps in the gravel outside. Sometimes she saw a flasher of a torch <laughs> for a chink in the curtain. It began to get late, nearly nine o'clock. She noticed on the mantelpiece. The four men searching the rooms seemed to grow weary, a trifle exasperated. Jack, would you mind giving me a drink? Surely I'll give you a drink. You mean uh, this whiskey? Yes, please. Just a small one. It might make me feel better. You can leave my glass. Sergeant Noonan wandered into the kitchen, came out quickly and said, Look, Mrs. Maloney, you know that oven of yours is still on, and the meat inside. Oh, dear me, so it is. I'd better turn it off for you, haven't I? Oh, would you, Jack? Thank you ever so much. 
if I allowed you to remain in his house without offering you decent hospitality. Why don't you eat up that lamb that's in the oven? It'll be cooked just right by now. I wouldn't dream of it. Oh, please, please, please eat it. Personally, I couldn't touch a thing. Certainly not what's been in the house when he was here. There was a good deal of hesitating among the policemen, but they were clearly hungry. And in the end, they were persuaded to go into the kitchen and help themselves. The woman stayed where she was, listening to them speaking among themselves. Their voices thick and sloppy, because their mouths were full of meat. <laughs> Have some more, Charlie? No, very right, thank you. Oh, she wants us to finish it. She said so. Be doing her a favor. Okay, then, give me some more. <laughs> That's a hell of a big club that guy must have used to hit poor Patrick. The doc says his skull was smashed to pieces, just like from a sledgehammer. Why, it ought to be easy to find. That's what I say.